So welcome to the Australian Apartment Advocacy's session today with CHU Insurance and our host Paul to talk about whether or not your apartment building is underinsured. And we're going to kind of like kick off with a presentation which uh, we have compiled together between ourselves and also CHU Insurance, which I think is going to be awesome because what it means is that um, we will be able to cover a whole range of topics. But at the same time, at the end of the session, if you've actually got a series of questions that you would like, or just even one question, please pop that onto the chat. Um, and so that, that way then I can ask those questions to Paul, because of course, potentially if you've got a hundred people in the room, um, once everybody starts to unmute, they tend to have a bit of reverberation. So we wanna try and keep this as clean as much as we possibly can. So just for, to start with, um, in case some of you are not aware about the Australian Apartment Advocacy, we're the voice of two and a half million people in Australia who choose apartments. And of course that number is only growing, right? Um, and what we do is a variety of things. So we do education. So we have the apartment buyer and owner education kit for Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and WA, working on ACT in South Australia as we speak. Um, and that's the first of its kind in Australia. But we can also mediate on behalf of you, whether that's with a developer or a builder or a strata manager or your neighbor, we often get involved in those kinds of resolution. We do lobby government for greater consumer protection. I have a bugbear about the fact that uh, we actually do not offer home warranty insurance for apartments four stories or higher. Um, and so we're definitely kind of like uh, on the bandwagon for that, as well as also mandatory inspections during construction, because we feel that for too long now, that's an area that has been neglected. And then we also have our research and we have a research paper at the moment that's out and alive and that's our national survey. So I will be sending you a link. And if you're an apartment owner, please complete that or apartment resident, please complete that so we can actually advocate on your behalf. The Australian Apartment Advocacy has been around since 2016 and we are committed to actually making sure that if anyone lives in an apartment or buys an apartment, they do so with complete confidence. And ideally what we want to do is actually another factor uh, to consider is reduce the amount of defects that we're seeing in apartment buildings from 50 to 60 percent down to 5 percent. So that's a major, major target, but I think something that definitely can be achieved. Um, we're trailblazers, we're tenacious, we don't like to actually give up on anything that we think is worth pursuing. We're passionate, we focus on best practice, and we love to empower our apartment owners and residents, as well as also the apartment community. So now that we're talking about best practice, and now that we're talking about empowering, let's head across to the CHU presentation that we're going to be receiving from Paul today. I'll hand to you, Paul. All right. Thank you, Sam. Okay, uh, hi everyone. So we're here to talk about uh, under insurance. Um, so firstly, I'll just go to the next slide here. So in the spirit of reconciliation, CHU acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders, past, present, emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Okay, so what we'll be talking about today, uh, uh, basically, as you can see, we'll go through under insurance and what is under insurance. How, how common is it? What is causing under insurance? And what does under insurance mean for the owner's corp? We've got a couple of case studies as well, which, which I'll go through. And in, in terms of valuations, when and why a valuation is needed and how to prevent under insurance. Okay, so firstly, what is under insurance? Under, under insurance, when it comes to the sum insured amount of, a, of an insurance policy, it's when it's not enough to cover the total cost of rebuilding, repairing, or replacing the building should it be damaged or destroyed. Building sum insured, it basically is the sum insured for which the pol it's the maximum we will pay out that's specified on, on the schedule. Go to the next. Sorry, my apologies. Okay, and 
I know most of these I'll just be reading out what's on the slides. Um, I'll try and elaborate on a few, a few of the points as well. But any questions you have, please take down notes and I'll be happy to, uh, to take those at the end. Okay, so how common is, is under insurance? Well, construction of buildings uh, has risen nearly 17% in the past 12 months. So if you think about it, for example, if you took, uh, if you did a valuation on your property a year ago, figures are showing that roughly in most cases on average, it's about 17% more now than it would have been last year. And I have seen these on a few valuations, uh, mm -hmm. as in a valuation was done a year ago and then a valuation was just received like just recently. And it has gone up in some cases by up to 30%. Correct. Okay. And so we've found that 42% of CHU customers maintain their current building sum insured. So there's been no increase uh, going up with CPI um, and in those cases leaving it uh, underinsured. That's correct. And you know, we, we feel for apartment owners and residents, right? Because they're not just facing insurance increases, but they're also probably incre you know, um, dealing with interest rate increases. So, and that's affecting, you know, their repayments for their apartment, plus also then the levies that they pay. So we're definitely seeing a situation where people are feeling slightly um, ambushed about the increase in costs, and they may be hesitant to actually then go and get a valuation. But, you know, from our perspective, um, that's somewhat, uh, I guess, uh, very risky, I would say, yeah. That's right. Okay, so what is causing under insurance? So COVID lockdowns had an impact, the Ukraine-Russia war that's going on, high demand for building materials, labor shortages. So everything's, um, I'll, I'll just go back to that slide yeah, and elaborate. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right. So some of these things you might ask, like, why would that affect the sum insured? So when, when there's high demand and when there's uh, certain events occur, prices just go up. The, when the demand is there, builders, repairers, you know, the costs go up and they, with shortage of, of parts and materials that increases the cost of those as well. So that's just elaborating a little bit further on those last two points. Well, we also ship a lot of um, items for construction of apartments in from China. And of course, you're right. So they've had severe lockdowns, right? And then at the same time, we were talking to someone the other day who actually is a quantity surveyor and actually then obviously tries to predict the cost of an apartment building for the developer. And one thing they hadn't taken into account was that, you know, shipping of a container, typically the cost was $3,000. It went up to 30,000 for a container and it's back down to four now. So these kinds of costs have not just, you know, gone up a small amount, they've like 10, 20% higher in terms of then their costs. So no. it has been substantial. No, that's right. And uh, I know of a particular example uh, of, of someone I know, they got a quote to do a renovation in their bathroom. And this is, uh, this is just a small thing. And it was done 13 months ago. They, they didn't go ahead with it, but then they just went ahead with it recently. Same company, same person, so same, same quote, and it was 30% more. So yeah. that's, that's, just, that's just an example of, of the increased costs. So this graph here uh, shows uh, shows an example of CPI increase along with uh, the house construction increases and then CHU sum insured. So you can see firstly mm -hmm. on the blue line, CPI has gone up recently. Mm -hmm. Now the house construction is, that's gone, you can see how high that's, that's gone up, but then you also see in green, the, the sum insured, although it's increased slightly, it's nowhere near in line of the other increases. So no, the good note, the good news is that orange line is coming down though, Paul, right? So, you yes. know, the valuations can work both ways, right? So if you, if you're overinsured, does it come down? <laughs> if you, if your value actually comes in lower, I'm sure it does. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So what is causing under insurance? So 
in, uh, increase in catastrophic events. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen in the news and what's happening uh, you know, around Australia, extreme bad weather is basically, it's, it's expected to continue uh, and the increase in claims costs. So if, if you think about it in terms of build, buildings, the sum insured of your property and the premium, uh, premium collected for it, it doesn't actually balance out what's the the costs to repair or rebuild those properties doesn't actually ba balance out with what those properties should be insured for. Well, and you're right. So we have seen some catastrophic kind of weather patterns that we would normally only see once every 10 years. They're happening, you know, every year. So the flooding that we've seen in New South Wales, Queensland, um, you know, and that does put a lot of pressure on the system, especially if when you see whole towns affected, not just one or two buildings. Um, and certainly with apartments being built on floodplains, we've certainly seen that as an impact as well. Correct. Okay, so this graph here uh, basically is a breakdown of the different catastrophic uh, weather events uh, that have occurred uh, within 2022. Um, and you can see basically at, at, at like the differences, these are the, the costs uh, of each one in, in color. So mm -hmm. they range from bushfire, earthquake, wind, hailstorm, flooding, as mentioned before, uh, and cyclone events. Mm -hmm. So this just gives you an idea over the years uh, how they how they have changed uh, with flooding obviously no surprise at the end there uh, mm. be, being a major one in 2022. Mm. Well we haven't seemed to have a break it was the bushfires now it's the flooding fingers crossed maybe this year we might be okay because we haven't seen too many uh, bad weather patterns happening so far this year have we? No not as yet um, you know, touch wood. Um, we've we've uh, we've looked at you know forecasts, and we don't expect it to change too much. But um, yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay. So, what does un under insurance mean to uh, to the owners' corporation? So, in the event of a major loss or catastrophic event leading to the damage or destruction of a building, any shortfall in insurance cover would need to be funded by the owners. So, in in any case. Um, I think we'll go to the next slide here as well. Yeah, this is where where we'll where I'll go. I was going to bring something up, but it pretty much falls in line with with what's shown here. Mm. So this particular case study that was mentioned before in Adelaide um, in July 22 uh, was when it when it was when it occurred, and the sum insured of the property was two hundred fifty five thousand dollars. So the townhouse was damaged by fire. Okay, uh, CHU arranged for a number of quotes to reinstate the property, and the most, the, the best one we could come up with was, was two hundred and eighty-two thousand. So in this particular case, we came up with a cash settlement of two hundred fifty-five thousand. This, as I mentioned before, we will pay up to the sum insured specified on the schedule of the policy, and the owners had to secure their own finance to cover the shortfall of twenty-seven thousand dollars to complete the works. So whenever the question comes up, uh, you know, what to insure your building for, uh, you, you must think that, like mentioned here, if there's any shortfall, um, or like if you ask yourself the question, can we afford to pay the higher cost because the increased sum insured? This is one of those questions where you might ask yourself, can you afford not to? Mm. Um, I agree, so because if that's, if that's $27,000 short for, for a townhouse, if we're thinking about a building with 100 apartments in it, right, then it becomes suddenly we're talking in the millions, correct? Yeah. We're not just yeah. talking in the thousands anymore. Absolutely. So we'll just go to the next slide here. So, uh, and this particular case study is another one. So it's a commercial strata property and some insured uh, $1,248,000. Now, the strata complex was damaged by fire and uh, in 2020 quotes, quotes to reinstate the property uh, came in. So during this time, due to uh, supply chain issues, COVID impacts and the price of materials, the cost to reinstate the building has, has increased. The sum insured is now insufficient and the owners are going to be left with a shortfall where they have to fund it, fund it themselves. So again, it's, it's another example, as mentioned before, um, you know, 
think that impacts that happen around the world, uh, this, this one here particularly being related to COVID was uh, caused the price of materials to increase and therefore uh, to re reinstate the building has gone up. And in terms of a shortfall, correct, yeah. Okay, so so it is a, uh, it's, it's a legal obligation to uh, obtain valuations. Most states and territories require valuations to be done every five years. In the current climate, it just makes good sense for your building valuation to be conducted more often, and the building is, should be insured for the full replacement value. The owner's corporation is responsible to ensure that there's no shortfall. So the, uh, the building would have to be insured for the amount spe specified on the valuation for full, full replacement. Um, these would include um, costs for the persons providing services for like rebuild, rebuilding, like surveying the property and all that would be stated on the valuation as well. Mm, correct. Now, um, so for others in other states, owners corporation is the same as body corporate or strata company, in case you're wondering. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is in some states, if you are not doing the right thing, if you can be shown to be negligible, then you're in deep trouble, aren't you, Paul, in terms of then the act? Yes, that's right. And yeah, apologies. Um, yeah, my uh, every reference I make is uh, specific to New South Wales. I sometimes forget that you know the wording is a little different in other states as well. So correct, correct. Okay, what should evaluation include? So it should include the uh, cost of building and common property, external features like pavements, fencing, recreation facilities. Each lot's permanent fixtures and structural improvements, allowance for inflation and cost for escalations of labour and materials, professional fees, demolition and debris removal costs. So to go on that a little bit further, uh, you will sometimes see valuations, uh, evaluation might actually include two uh, replacement costs. It might have one what, what the current is and some of them will even say you know, within 12 months, j j just just giving you the that it's almost like a forecast. It should mm -hmm. still be it's, it should still be insured for what the current value is, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, sometimes they add, add that in there as well. Yeah, and I think that demolition and debris removal is very very important, right? Because um, I have known a number of uh, shires, for example, wanting to rebuild a, a bridge, and then they've not actually. Um, quoted for the debris and for the demolition and then that's been an additional cost on top of that and that can be one of the most expensive costs can't it no that's right yeah it's um you will get the breakdown on the ones that, that show it and yeah once you it, it can be a good portion a good fraction of the actual total replacement cost mm, correct okay in this section uh, how to avoid risk of under insurance so the building sum insured should be reviewed annually. Um, even if you don't get, a, 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 as it's mentioned there, even if you don't get a new valuation, uh, the conversation should come up. And this uh, would come up in any event if there's uh, any ongoing world events, you know, that may cause uh, prices to increase uh, uh, for that matter. Uh, but as mentioned here, every two to three years is like, is probably the safest bet to go. Uh, you'll need to factor in all requirements, including removal of debris, professional fees, escalation of costs during the rebuild, as mentioned before, and also be aware of any undisclosed renovations, improvements by the owners. Uh, owners need to, uh, need to make the owners corp aware uh, that any works within the unit uh, need to ensure that they're part of the overall building sum insured. Now. We have certain parts of the policy section that actually have an allowance. Um, obviously, a valuer will go into a building. They're not going to go into everyone's individual units and see, oh, okay, I see you've made this upgrade, or they go into the back and see, okay, this uh, this balcony has been upgraded. So um, our policy has uh, an allowance for uh, lot owners, fixtures and fittings, uh, which is already built into the policy, which is for $250,000. And that is for each unit. 
Mm, mm. Well, as it is, you're actually meant to uh, get permission from your committee or your strata council uh, for any improvements and it does need to be circulated. So be aware, please, if you are renovating, you do need to let your neighbours know. And that means all the neighbours in your complex. <laughs> Correct. Yes. We, some of the disclosures I come across is um, solar panels uh, are yes. a main one uh, so solar panels are added on and that does form part of the building insurance it is a fixture um, if if the owners uh, depending on how much the solar panels cost um, if, if if they feel that the sum insured needs to be increased to reflect that um, uh, this is prior to evaluation being done of course um, then they can choose to decide to increase their building sum insured but then again there's always those items that are done within the lots. And yes, as Sam mentioned, uh, that should be uh, disclosed and uh, to the owner's corporation. And if, if there's any uh, increase, we don't really need to, uh, policy-wise this is, we don't really need to list any items. If we listed any upgrades on policies on where there's, you know, dozens of units within the property, <laughs> the policy schedule would be many, many pages. So that's not yeah. necessary. Uh, like I said, the lot owners fixtures and fittings policy uh, covers that. And that's $250,000 per unit. Hmm. Well, that's great. So we have come to the end of Paul's presentation. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to put them through on the chat. Um, from my perspective, um, why are people, we've obviously talked about why people are kind of like, um, you know, not necessarily getting their um, valuations updated. Who do they go to? So obviously your strata manager or body corporate manager can assist with you with this, but who do you typically um, go to for evaluation, Paul? So the evaluations, um, our wording and how we communicate this, it should be done by someone that's qualified. Uh, Every state has different uh, legislation or uh, how, how it should be done, but generally they need to be qualified. So they usually have certification uh, that they meet the, the standards uh, relative to each state. Yeah. So a quantity surveyor or someone of that nature, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. That, that, that would meet the requirements to be qualified. Uh, the, the, the word qualified doesn't really, it's not really specific. And I can understand if people have questions about that. Um, again, because it's such a broad, uh, broad area, yeah. it's, it, they just have to have the certification. And like I said, usually they will, they, they will have in it, in their certificate, uh, whether they're qualified to do, uh, the valuations. Hmm. And if you do get a valuation done and you feel that maybe it's extremely inflated and so, you know, uh, unexpected, um, I would recommend you get a second uh, evaluation. What do you think about that? A second valuation is, or, or a second opinion is definitely a good idea. Uh, I've, in my years of seeing valuations done between two, two different um, valuers, uh, I have seen differences. Uh, they're more or less, more or less, they're close enough. Um, but if you think that it's been uh, overpriced or, or overvalued, um, you can get a second opinion uh, just to be sure. Uh, ultimately, it is up to the, regardless of what's on the valuation, it's the owners' corporations' building. Um, it's up to them what to insure the building for, and that goes the other way. If they think it's uh, if it's undervalued they can choose to go above the sum insured. Again, yeah. like I said, it is their property and that they will know best um, of any additional items that may have been missed on the valuation. Correct. And I think, you know, what we're actually obviously seeing is that a uh, whole situation where we are seeing an upsurge at the moment in valuations, and that can only be good in terms of the value of the building and um, obviously resale. Um, invariably, that will settle down. So even though your policy might go up, you know, one year or two year, hopefully with the kind of situation we're seeing with the moderation of uh, construction costs and so forth, that that may not be an ongoing concern, right? So, all right, yep. so I've got um, Nicole here. Um, I understand the current drivers are under insurance, but will there be a time that those drivers change and premiums reduce? We we're just talking about that. I feel caught in a cycle of events that I agree are happening, but labor markets correct 
supply chains improve and cost of freight reduces. Well, that's completely correct, Nicole. So, um, but what I wouldn't recommend, because I'm one of those people that always believes in insurance, right? If I travel, I buy insurance. I have, I have cars insured, I have my home contents, my building insured, right? Um, it's always the way, isn't it? When you actually have, in fact, not insured, invariably something goes wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so consequently, if you feel like there may be a change, you know, in the cycle, and it will be, everything in the construction sector is cyclical. Um, don't hold off in the hope that that might happen in one to two years, because that might be the time frame in which something happens to your building, and then you're caught short. So while you may be paying as an individual, maybe another. $200 for your insurance premium, at the end of the day, that's certainly cheaper than trying to find a couple of million dollars across the body corporate or the owner's corporation, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, so I think long term. Um, so I've had another message here from Emma. I've heard of some corporations going by what the, cons the council valuation is. Well, that's certainly deadly. Um, I've seen this value differ from a normal valuation what do councils base their valuation on? Rates? Um, council valuations, it's, uh, again, it's, uh, I don't know how they would conduct their, their valuation off the property. So I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, the best way to do it is by a qualified valuer to make sure that not only the building is, is, is calculated for its replacement, but all those other things set in legislation. So the cost of rebuilding fees and charges, uh, removal of debris, all that is factored in. Yeah, correct. And also um, it often depends on how many bathrooms you have <laughs> in terms of the council well. rate, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, I, I know the council may, ha may have information of like, you know, this is a three, bed uh, three bedroom, um, you know, two three pre bedrooms, yeah, two bathrooms. So th those things uh, come into play. But yeah, the best way to do it is by a valuer who actually comes out, surveys the property properly and uh, gives a replacement value. Yes, that's right. And uh, of course, most councils are doing a desktop analysis. And even at times, um, they're actually out of whack in terms of what they will be valuing the property at and also then charging for rates. So I do believe that you're right, that you do need to get um, a valuer out to make sure that you've covered your basis as you said, to be sure, to be sure. Now I've had a bit of a tricky question here, um, Paul, and you may want to actually speak to um, this person offline, but um, so they're saying their apartment complex has been insured with CHU for many years. The complex does not have reticulated natural gas, which obviously lowers the risk, um, but you do not quote providing a premium discount price where there's no gas provided. Um, is there a reason for that or is it just that you kind of like tend to package everything together? Yeah, so there's many f factors that go into changing the premium of a policy. Um, and we capture uh, everything that we capture is available for, uh, for people to see, even getting direct quotes for us. You can see the questions, the tick boxes we have, uh, which start off as simple as uh, construction, which is probably the key to uh, quote, quoting, uh, quoting your premium. And then it goes right down to things like alarms, um, you know, when I say fire alarms, like sprinkler systems and everything, mm -hmm. um, we don't have anything that triggers a discount for for the gas, the, the natural gas that was mentioned. Um, if if there's if there's something with that that reduces the risk, um, it's it's not something that's that we provide a discount for. It's more of a package. There could there, the list could go on. Uh, if you were to break down, you know, what causes less risk uh, mm -hmm. in premiums, but, mm -hmm. you know, we can't, obviously we can't include everything. No, of course not. And then Maureen's asked, will CHU abide by a written valuation if the insurance has been taken out accordingly? Well, I'm sure that you would want something as a written valuation, wouldn't you? You wouldn't take anything verbatim on, you know, in terms of um, dialogue, it'd have to be written. Uh, yes, so most, we tend to uh, request everything in writing. Uh, mm. It's just a better capture process. Uh, mm. And uh, in terms of when it was disclosed, mm. 
do you if if that meant do you have to provide us with the valuation uh the answer is no um if you simply disclose to us we obtained the valuation and this the replacement is x amount we can go off that and if you get a valuation you do need to tell your insurance company don't you paul <laughs> yes, yes. Um, despite what people may think, um, you know, we're, we're not the uh, we're, we're not evil. Um, you, uh, please provide your valuations. Um, if, if anything, as a uh, although we don't provide advice, as a duty of care, we will come. We will come back and uh, you know point out if there's if there's anything wrong, um, something for consideration. Um, and we deal with valuations all the time. So things like including uh, what valuations to make sure that they include the the cost of removal of debris uh, and any other fees. Uh, we will make sure that that's uh, that's all included in there yeah right good so you do like a double check to make sure that uh everything has been covered that's good that's right. um so i've got another question here um in terms of um so emma's asked if we can provide a link to each of the states acts you'll need to leave that with me emma um david has said say the sum insured is one million and a claim is made that will cost two hundred and fifty thousand. if chu deems the building was underinsured by say 20 percent Will they will the claim payout also be reduced by twenty percent, even though the sum insured is significantly higher than the claimed amount? So they we're talking about a portion rather than the whole building. Yeah. So um, we, we will always seek out uh, the most efficient and cost effective uh, way of re rebuilding the, the property. Um, we won't we won't re we won't reduce the payout. Uh, the building is insured up to the sum insured specified. So, for example, if it, if there's 20 units and one unit um, gets damaged, but that's like 25% of the total value, as as I mentioned before, as a duty of care, we may mention it and suggest you know this property might might be undervalued, but we will still pay up to the sum insured, so the million dollars that are uh, specified um, to rebuild the property. If it gets near or to the total amount, it can be deemed a total loss. Um, and that's where discussions uh, may take place uh, if there's to be a payout or a full replacement of the building. Yeah. I hope, I hope that answers your question, David. Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, I think it did. All right. Well, I think that's the end of all the questions. So I appreciate everybody's involvement. That's great to see, um, you know, because these are the opportunities, right, for you to actually speak to a specialist um, somewhat incognito um, and actually get the advice that you need. And I'm certainly hoping that some of you will, obviously, once we release the recording, um, that we actually, you might take this to your committee or to your council of owners to actually make sure that they're also aware of their obligations and responsibilities. Um, hold on, we've got one more question that's come in. Um, so this question actually says, in Queensland, a recent valuation, sorry, my apologies, uh, for a unit complex by a major valuation firm for insurance purposes included in the fine print, it did not include fluctuations in building materials relating to natural disasters. I'm assuming I increased the sum insured by 30%. Ooh. Okay, so uh, with that one- You would get a second opinion, wouldn't you? <laughs> Like that looks like they're covering their asses. Excuse my language, but it does look like that's what they're doing. It, it's it's always a good idea, to, uh, as mentioned before, to get a second opinion. Uh, with that, we we have a section in the, in our policy uh, where you can include insurance for catastrophe events, um, and a catastrophe event doesn't necessarily mean okay. You, although a fire for, for your property is would be, I'd say yeah, that's a catastrophe. By definition, if it's deemed a, a catastrophe zone by the insurance council, you can uh, you can actually increase your building on our policy by fifteen or thirty percent. Like, and this this is sometimes what you see in valuations. Um, so if if you feel that is a policy section that's needed, um, you can actually include a catastrophe cover as well. Well, that's great. So then with the catastrophe cover, that doesn't actually have to come into play until it's a catastrophe. Is that what you're telling me? 
Correct, yes. So the, the building is, sum insured is still the building sum insured. Let's use 1 million, for example. Yeah. Um, if you take out the additional cover of, of, catastro of catastrophe cover, if the area is deemed a catastrophe zone, and this is what might, because if it, it won't just be one property, if, if there's a catastrophe in the area, there could be multiple areas. Yeah. So this is where we mentioned before, where the cost of materials and labor increase, mm. policy, that policy section will, will, uh, will come into play. And mm. depending on whether you chose 15 or 30% uh, will be added on uh, to, to, your, to the rebuilding costs of the property. Well, for those um, you know, apartment buildings which have been in areas that have been affected by this over the last two or three years, that would be certainly something that I would suggest you take out because it does allow you the flexibility, right, to actually be totally covered because a 30% shortfall is a significant shortfall um, and not everybody's going to be able to pay for that. So then you would actually end up being homeless <laughs> um, if it is a real complete catastrophe. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, lovely. Well, thank you, Paul. I really appreciate this conversation today because it's something that we certainly, as I said before, have found uh, to be, you know, an ongoing conversation at every kind of forum that we've attended. So, all right. So just quickly to round out the session today, we have got some future events coming up on our um, YouTube channel. Um, and so you can register for these as well. So we've got about how to renovate an apartment kitchen would you believe? All the things to think about for that. Retrofitting your apartment to gas hot water. Um, cladding steps to provide greater protection because we are actually, in fact, uh, calling on the AS5113 to be mandated. Because um, at the moment, if you actually pass a small scale test, um, then you don't need to do the large scale test. But of course, the large scale, as you would know, Paul, um, has a lot of implications because cladding is just not whacked onto a building. It's got insulation, it's got glue, and all those elements affect. And what's concerning me about the situation with cladding is that we've actually got a lot of buildings um, that are being reclad and not necessarily reclad with non combustible products. So, you know, so we do need to be very mindful about how we pick and choose what products we're going to put onto our building. Uh, and then on the 18th of May, we've been talking to a company that actually recycles green waste within apartment buildings. And I think uh, these new technologies and ideas, they're very, very interesting and certainly well worth um, bringing to the fore. So we can't do what we do without our sponsors. Unfortunately, I would love to say that we're funded by government. That's not the, the case at all. And uh, CHU Insurance and also Flex Insurance are one of those sponsors. So we're very grateful um, and they're a national sponsor, very grateful to their support and how they actually help us do what we do. So thank you, CHU. All right, that's the end of the presentation today in the chat. I hope that you have had um, an interesting session as much as I've had an interesting session with Paul. Um, so thank you very much for coming along today. And certainly I hope to see you at one of our future events. Paul, any last words from you? No, uh, thanks, Sam. Thank you everyone for your time. Um, I hope this helped. And um, yeah, if there's anything anyone else needs, uh, yeah, please feel free to reach out. Fantastic. What I'll do is when I send out the video to all the participants, I'll include your details, Paul, if that's okay. So yeah, absolutely. that way then if they need to chat with you further, they can do so. All right. Well, happy Easter, everybody. We're not far off it. Would you believe? I can't believe we're at the end of March now. Where did that first three months go? Anyway, don't, let's, not, let's not jinx ourselves too much. Otherwise, we'll be thinking about Christmas next. So everybody have a lovely Easter. Please stay safe. And there's no doubt we will see you again very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Paul. That was beaut. Speak soon. Bye. Okay, bye.